All right. One of the, the challenges it seems like folks face when they are trying to learn how to uh, develop the models for beam deflections is how to interpret what the boundary conditions ought to be that go along with a particular situation. So we're going to go through a whole variety um, of these different situations and talk about how you figure out what's going on. For instance, we've got a fixed end and a lot of folks in the statics world would have told you, well, the fixed end provides a non-zero shear and a non-zero moment. And that's true. But I look at it slightly differently, and that's the, I teach statics in this different kind of way too, and that is, I say, well, at a fixed end, the displacement that would happen transverse to the longitudinal axis has to be zero, and there has to be a shear force to prevent that, or make sure, that is, that that is zero. Same thing. I look at this and say there's no rotation permitted and there has to be a bending moment. In this case, that would actually be down, uh, be a negative bending moment to make sure that the rotation is zero. One thing that, that happens here is that if I say that one of these, say the displacement is zero, then the corresponding uh, internal force value cannot be zero. So rotations go with moment. If I say one is zero, the other cannot be transverse displacement. If I say that's zero, then the other one, the shear, cannot be. Right? Now what we haven't talked about is the axial condition here, and generally in this course of uh, mechanics and materials, we will not. That will be left for your, um, your structural analysis course to talk about the axial in combination with all this, the other stuff. But the short answer of that, this is, is that the axial condition is decoupled in our typical basic first order modeling from the transverse things. All right, let's look at a free end here. And at that free end, then we've got the possibility of a displacement that will be zero, or sorry, will not be zero, it will come down, that's little v, and some sort of slope or rotation will happen. So neither one of those is zero, but on the other hand, for this specific condition, then the shear would be zero and the bending moment would be zero for those end conditions. Right? Now these are the two most common end conditions that we might have, maybe followed by the pin roller end. When you get into doing computer modeling, what you're going to find out is that when you specify where your supports are at, you're going to be specifying which displacements are zero and that the default will probably be that they're not zero. So this case right here would be the default situation in most typical computer programs. And if you have a support, you have to go tell it which displacements at that location are zero. And it'll handle the rest for you. So for instance, the pin or the roller at the end, then the shear, of course, would not be zero. It's going to be equal to the reaction, but the bending moment will. And the transverse displacement, well, that will be zero, but we'll have a non-zero rotation at that location. Right? Similarly, when we get to what happens right here, this is a this is the pin or roller in the middle. Right? Notice here the only difference between the pin and the roller was the axial condition, which we already said we're going to ignore. Right? The pin and the roller in the mid is a little bit different here. For sure, the transverse displacement, well that will be zero. But the slope is not going to be zero. But here's something kind of important to take note of. And that is, if we were to draw a tangent to the elastic deflected shape, right? So there's a tangent, right? And originally, this beam was horizontal in its orientation. Well, now it's rotated. And notice that on the left side of this versus the right side, that that rotation on the left and that rotation on the right have to be equal to each other. That would be called the slope compatibility. Right? Now, likewise, when we, or not likewise, maybe similarly here, if you look at what the bending moment is here, it's not going to be equal to zero at all. But the moment at the left and the moment at the right, well, 
that will turn out to be equal to each other also. There's a moment compatibility that's happening on either side of this because there's no applied couple at this particular location. There is an applied force that is the reaction that's here. So the shear is not equal to zero and the shear to the left of that is not going to be equal to the shear to the right of that support. They're indeed going to differ by whatever this reaction is that's being provided right there. That'll be the change in the shear will be the value of that reaction. Right now, the slide or glide uh, support is kind of a, a strange one in the sense that of the way you might sort of draw it. And it also is, it, it could change depending on what you mean by this slide or the guide. But if we had a beam that to the right is the rest of the beam, and here we are at the end, that could slide freely in a slot back and forth, so in and out, but it couldn't rotate and it couldn't go up and down. Well, in that case, that particular kind of slide is going to have a release in the axial, but otherwise this thing is going to act just like the fixed end. Right, so there's a little bit you got to kind of understand what the context is, and this all comes back to, well, what's going on with the displacements? If the shear, or that would be capital V, is non-zero and little v is, and there's no rotation, well then we have to have moments, and we have to shear, we have to have forces to make sure that that happens. So this is ultimately just a relaxation of the axial forces. And that's, as soon as you relax that, you have to allow for an in and out movement of that particular thing. Right? Now when it comes to, say, what in reality we oftentimes have a support that is on flexible material, and so now you have a linkage between some of these things. Now, if this is truly a case where we only have a translational spring, then the moment here is going to be zero and the rotation is not going to be zero. But when it comes to the uh, what goes on with the end shear, well, if we had some load out here, this thing would want to compress downwards, right? Let's say the load was going downwards. And there would absolutely be a force in that spring, F equals KX, or in this case, V. And to get the signs right, we might actually have to put a little minus sign in there. Then you have to figure out, well, positive up, and that's going to be a downwards force. Is that a positive shear or a negative shear? Different sign conventions. One sign convention for the overall displacements and another one potentially for the interior stuff. Right. And so little v here would be equal to, let's see, just do this the other way, capital V divided by K. So there's a relationship between those two that has to be taken account of. Right. Right. Same thing could be true of a rotational type of spring here. So now this is kind of weird, and we're trying to indicate there's like a little clock um, mechanism going here. And for whatever reason, when this printed out, you can't see that little... Uh, spiral that's there. In here the shear would be equal to zero. Your um, little v might not be equal to zero, but the sorry, but the uh, m would equal some sort of then again a k times theta and theta would be equal to m over k to get that relationship that's going on here. Now other common situations that might end up, uh, end up happening here, we've got a, um, a cantilever end that has a concentrated force out here, like a diving board kind of situation. And now what you have to deal with is that, hey, our shear immediately to the right of that is not going to be zero. In fact, it's going to be equal to something like uh, the force that's out here, but in this case, using the positive sign convention, if F is going downwards, then shear would be end up being a negative. You've got to be careful how you put the minus sign in here. 
um, because you could say upwards is positive for that capital F, in which case inherently if it's physically acting downwards, then you put the negative sign in here. Kind of how you decide you want to do this. But if I specify shear, I cannot also specify the value of the translational displacement. Moment here would be zero, but rotation would not be equal to zero. Right? And just a couple of more to take a look at. Here we've got an end moment where the shear is zero, but the transverse displacement is not. The moment here would be equal to the opposite. You say the opposite, what are you talking about? Well, because that would be a frowny face uh, moment, right? M naught, so the end moment would have to ultimately be a negative value. And of course, the rotation would not, oops, would not be equal to zero here. When we have a concentrated force in the middle, as long as the beam is continuous here, what you're going to have to deal with is that V to the left is not going to be equal to V immediately to the right. Before that, I said that was a minus or a plus. You could do the same thing, but we've got this little one and two there. That's just right around point at point B, right? And so, but the, the once again, the displacement here can't be zero. We're going to have to allow it to move back and forth. And of course, the change in the shear would be given to us by the value of, of that force. But the moment, on the other hand, on either side is going to have to have continuity, just like theta 1 would have to equal theta 2 at B. Right, so there's slope compatibility here, just like the moment compatibility, but there's a discontinuity in shear, but there, by the way, there had better not be any break in the beam in terms of deflections right there at point B. Right. Similarly here, we're going to have a change in the moment from one side to the other at B. The slope though, because we have a nice smooth continuous beam, then the slope is not going to change. That's going to be the same right there. The shear will equal each other on the other side of this applied couple. And the transverse deflection will also have continuity as we go across. Right? Then you get to the hint, and that's where things can change from one side to the other. There's side one, side two. So V1 will equal V2, but theta1 will not equal theta2. It's a hinge, so the moment will have to be equal to zero at B. This is all with respect to right at this point B, right where the hinge is at. And the shear would have to equal on either side at B. The hinge only releases the moment. And when you release the moment, then you're creating a break in the slope. Right? Those are the most common set of boundary conditions that go along with beams. And we have to get all those right to then correctly work with the differential equation and get to um, the deflection expressions that we're going to derive.